Okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sergey Khan. I'm a professor of anthropology here at Dartmouth and uh, Native American studies. Uh, it gives me a distinct pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker today, uh, Mr. Gordon Sachs, who uh, is our fifth speaker in the series sponsored by the Rockefeller Center and several other organizations on campus uh, in a series on perspectives on the Israeli-Palestinian crisis. Our speaker is a very distinguished uh, human rights activist, Jewish philanthropist, um, advisor to a number of uh, US presidents and politicians in Israel, United States, and, and worldwide. So I'd like to say a few words about him. Uh, he was born 1933 in Indiana. He's a Midwesterner. He did attend Dartmouth College in the 1950s for two years. He didn't graduate, but we know that a lot of very famous people, including Robert Frost, didn't graduate and went on to do very important and wonderful things. So we won't hold it against Mr. Zacks. He said that he had to go back to Ohio to marry his beloved, and they're still married after all these years. So that's the reason. Uh, but he loved it here, and he said it was a wonderful, wonderful time. When Israel was established in 1948, he was 15, and so he watched as a teenager uh, the terrible experience of the Jewish people during the Holocaust, and then the, the birth of a nation, the rebirth of the land, and the redemption of the Jewish people as Israel was established. And he saw that the importance of uh, helping Jewish people through philanthropy. And as a very successful businessman, eventually as a chairman of a $100 million uh, corporation, he was able to engage in philanthropy and rose to eventually be the head of United Jewish Appeal. So you could see how prominent he was, and he tirelessly worked in that area. And as he said this afternoon to me, in <coughs> 1973, he came to the realization that that wasn't enough. He always did this voluntarily, by the way. Uh, in 1973, during the Yom Kippur War, in his words, he clearly saw, because he had access to a lot of information, inside information, that Israel was facing a mortal danger. He was on the verge of being destroyed and was saved by emergency aid from the United States. No other nation was willing to lend a hand to this country. And so after that time, he decided to become more familiar with international politics, particularly American and Israeli. And eventually, he began became involved in helping Jews, particularly in two places where they were endangered, the Soviet Union as the Soviet Jewry immigration struggle heated up, and Ethiopia. And even more importantly, he realized that without American government's involvement, Israel would be always in danger. So he, he worked directly with several Israeli prime ministers and two American president. Presidents. He was asked by George H. W. Bush, who at that time was <coughs> uh, running as a vice president with um, Ronald Reagan, who was running for president in 1980. He was asked to be involved as a fundraiser and involved in the campaign in the Jewish community, and he would gladly agreed. After the Reagan-Bush ticket. One, he was asked to uh, be a, to join the cabinet, and which was, of course, a very important opportunity. But Mr. Sachs chose to be a private advisor to the vice president rather than the cabinet member. He felt that he could accomplish more for the goals that he set out for himself in terms of helping Israel. And as he said, after that, he met monthly f with the vice president. Eventually, eight years later, when the vice president became the president, that relationship continued. Once again, he turned down an appointment, this time of an ambassador, and felt that he could accomplish a lot more again as a confidant, a private advisor. And in that capacity, again, he traveled worldwide, met a lot of very interesting people. And just to, to finish up, that experience of 
meeting courageous, interesting, prominent, influential people, courageous people, um, eventually found its way in his, his wonderful book called Defining Moments, Stories of Character, Courage, and Leadership, published a few years ago. It's a series of interviews and stories about people, most of them famous, some of them less famous, but equally courageous and, and fascinating. And uh, he brought this book, copies of this book here, so we are able to see it and acquire a copy, and I'm sure uh, Mr. Zachs would be happy to, to sign it for us. So today, he is as concerned with <coughs> safety, security, and survival of the country that is dear to him and I think many of us in this room and on this campus. So his thoughts on, on those subjects I think will be of interest to, to all of us, whether they're academic issues or more personal, um, emotional and intellectual issues. So I'd like us to welcome Mr. Gordon Sachs. <laughs> Thank you. I need help. <laughs> First, uh, come on up and push the buttons that right. need to be pushed. <laughs> First of all, I just want to say it's really great to be back at Dartmouth. I had a wonderful experience here. And I had the privilege today to have lunch with one of the professors that had a profound influence upon my life uh, that I not had an opportunity to see and share and thank uh, in the manner in which he was entitled. So I thank you for bringing me here. Uh, they said they wanted me to talk about Israel's right to defend itself and the justification for the fence. That's not what I want to talk about. I'm more than happy to talk about that in the Q&A. <coughs> but Mr. Uh, Netanyahu met this week with President Obama and they talked about some very serious issues that affect the future of the region and future of the relationship between Israel and the United States. Talked about Iran, and nuclear, they talked about the Palestinian-Israeli peace process. And as Sergi mentioned, I've been involved as a volunteer since 1948. I've been involved from the biases that he shared with you as a passionately committed Jew and a very committed American in struggling to understand the nature of the threats to America and to Israel and to see what I can do to be a part of a solution. I used to believe, and I have been to Israel over a hundred times. I've been to over a hundred countries in the world and I came to where I'm at from a very parochial point of view. 1948, the creation of the State of Israel, the aftermath of the Holocaust, and I wanted to be a part of the rebirth of the land and the redemption of the people of Israel. But after what I've been experiencing and have had the opportunity to learn, I understand in a much broader sense that the cornerstone to assuring freedom in the world is America. And that America needs to be physically strong, morally strong, economically strong, and they need to have a sense of responsibility for engagement in the world. And if without that, not just Israel can't make it over the next hundred years, but other countries dependent upon us will have trouble making it as well. So I became, in the role that I played for 12 years, as an informal private advisor to first Vice President and then President Bush, I met with them once a month, privately, just the two of us, on this whole range of issues that Sergi mentioned. And in that role, I had access to information. I don't have access to that information today. But I learned certain things that helped me understand a threat emerging that is not, at the time, clear. But today has become much more so. And yet I still don't believe it's understood. And it's a threat not just to Israel, it's a threat to America. 
And I want to talk about that in the context of a peace process in the Middle East. Because from 1948 until 2000, I, among many, was hopeful that there could be a peace process concluded between the Palestinians and the Israelis. And I thought that Yasser Arafat, as a secular, non-religious leader of the PLO, was capable of making the decisions that would result in a peace treaty. That blew up in smoke in the Wyeth plantation between Clinton and Mr. Barack, then the Prime Minister of Israel, and Mr. Arafat. Clinton spent an enormous amount of time hammering out what he thought was an agreement. That agreement blew up on the last night when it was to be signed because Arafat walked away from it. And Arafat walked away from it because he talked to the king of Saudi Arabia, and the king of Saudi Arabia said, you will not sign that agreement without the right of return of the Palestinian refugees to Israel. That was a deal breaker from the very beginning of the discussions. So that blew up in smoke. And that became, for me, a telling moment. That basically said to me, this is not about a two-state solution. This is not about the creation of a Palestinian state. This is about the eradication of a Jewish state. And under those ground rules, no peace process is really going to get started. And so then the focus, from my point of view, started to shift. And to understand not simply Israel-Palestine but to understand the grander and global conflict within which this Middle East struggle was being carried out. <clears throat> what I learned in 1983, when the Beirut barracks were blown up by Hezbollah, aided and abetted by the Syrians, was that there was a struggle between forces of fundamentalist Islam, whether Sunni or Shia, and the forces of human rights and democracy. And it's that struggle, supplemented by the threat of nuclear proliferation and tactical nuclear weapons, that I want to talk about here. And place in context what's happening in Israel-Palestine within the context of this greater struggle. When this is the greater Middle East, over here is Egypt, up here is Turkey, over here is Iran, over here is Afghanistan, and here is Pakistan, and over here is India. This is the Saudi Arabia, this is the Straits of Hormuz, and these are the Emirates and Kuwait. 57% of the proven oil reserves of the world are still in the Persian Gulf. 57%. Roughly 30% of the production capacity of the world is in the Persian Gulf. Roughly 27% of the daily production comes out of the Persian Gulf. Now, in the context of this struggle between fundamentalist Islam and Western civilization or values, let me frame what the nature of that struggle is as I understand it. Islam is a religion, the Muslim religion, has a billion four hundred million followers worldwide. It is estimated by those who study this that 10 to 15 percent of the Muslims of the world subscribe or support fundamentalist Islam. So 85 to 90 percent don't. So this is not about the moderate Islams. 
This is not about the Muslims who are victims of the Taliban in Afghanistan or the victims of the Taliban in Pakistan. This is about the Taliban. This is about Al Qaeda. This is about Hezbollah. This is about Hamas. This is about Iran. Whether Shia or Sunni, the objective of both fundamentalist groups is the same. What they want is to cre recreate a caliphate from Spain to Indonesia and to convert or slaughter all those who stand in their way. And it's basically the struggle between Shia and Sunni is about who's going to rule that caliphate, the Sunni or the Shia. And it's about the legitimacy of the authority of each to claim the right to lead. But the goal is the same. And there's no tolerance and there's no respect for difference. Now we have made a very, very costly blunder, in my opinion, in the manner in which we have defined the democracy. We say we're trying to spread democracy around the world. Well, what is a democracy? A form of government elected by the people? Is that a democracy? Do they have a democracy in Gaza? Hamas was elected. Do they have a democracy in Lebanon? Hezbollah was elected. Do they have a democracy in Iran? Ahmadinejad was elected. The answer is no. Not by my definition of a democracy. My definition of a democracy is not how the government is elected, but what are the rights that the people have once the government is empowered. And the critical rights for me of a democracy is the right of me by law to be different from you so long as I respect your right to be different from me. And if there's mutual respect guaranteed by law of our right to be different from each other, that's the beginning. The second thing for me is my right by law to demonstrate peacefully in favor of or opposed to the policies of my government without the fear of being killed for doing it. Very few people in the world enjoy that right. Very few. We have that right here. And it's very precious that we hold on to it. Now, fundamentalist Islam wants to create a certain form of Islam, strict adherence to the Sharia law, observance within the country of all that is revealed in the Quran in all aspects of your life. Islam as a word means submission and you are to submit to the will of Allah as revealed by his last prophet Muhammad in the Quran in all aspects of your life. Now what is it that we are talking about in America and in Western democracy? We're talking about human rights. Human rights for whom? For women, for gays, for men, for blacks, for whites, for Jews, for anybody. So long as they are peaceful and respectful of the right of others to be different from them. Human rights and submission are in conflict. And that threat is the real threat behind the antagonism that I see being perpetrated uh, under the umbrella of fundamentalist Islam. Now why is it happening now? Why didn't it happen 50 years ago, 100 years ago? Because these threats were present before and they're, as they were present today. In the major countries over there, if you go here to Egypt, is Egypt a democracy? Anybody? Pardon? No. Okay, what's the primary goal of Mubarak? 
stay in power. Okay. When he had control of all communication inside of Egypt, when he had control of the school system, when he could control what you read, what you heard on television, what you heard on the radio, he had a very good job, in term, he had a very good chance of controlling what you thought. And then somebody came along with a computer, and somebody came along with a cell phone, and somebody came along with all these electronic gadgets that take you beyond borders. Today, new ideas about human rights <coughs> penetrate the barriers that were artificially created over the past 50 years to keep bad ideas out of Egypt and all the other countries we're going to talk about. <coughs> Saudi Arabia. I went to Saudi Arabia. I went to Saudi Arabia after I had been to Kuwait. When I was in Kuwait, they told me how bad things were in Saudi Arabia in terms of human rights. And they told me that the king had put controls on what people could hear and see on television. And that he outlawed um, satellite TV. So I get to Saudi Arabia. I'm driving around in the cities with a guide. And I see satellite TV dishes every place. I said, what the hell's going on here? So I sat down with a friend of mine from Saudi Arabia, and I said, what's happening here? He says, very simple. He says, the Wahhabis, the religious establishment in Saudi Arabia, for the reasons that I just articulated, are very much opposed to satellite television coming into Saudi Arabia and destroying their control over the people. The king, out of respect to his relationship with the Wahhabis, where they run the religious and he runs the secular side of the country, has to be sympathetic and responsive to the Wahhabi wishes. So he gets a law passed outlawing satellite television discs in Saudi Arabia. But, my friend says, the king also has to be sensitive to the will of the people. The people want to watch satellite television. So he doesn't enforce the law. And he satisfies the Wahhabis, and he satisfies the people. But he's threatened by the ideas that he has no control over coming into his country and threatening the fabric of his society. Now, where did Al-Qaeda get started? Got started in Egypt. And what did the king do with Al-Qaeda? With Osama bin Laden? He sent them, encouraged them to go to Afghanistan to fight the war against the Soviets in Afghanistan. He funded them. Now what did he do when he funded them? He got rid of them. He got them to fight someplace else and not threaten to undermine his kingdom. And they're masters of this. Each one of these rulers in these non-democratic states has as their goal what this gentleman said, staying in power. And human rights as an idea is the most threatening idea that could undermine their ability to maintain control of their population. And that to me is the essential nature of this struggle. They use terrorism to fulfill and achieve their goals. The enemy is not terrorism. The enemy is not Muslims. The enemy is fundamentalist Islam, utilizing terrorists and terrorism and utilizing potentially nuclear weapons. Now, in that context, let me ask you a question. If by some miracle, Obama and Netanyahu were able to come about a plan to create a peace resolution with the Palestinians. 
and tomorrow we have peace between Israel and the Palestinians. Has that fundamentally changed anything that I've just talked about? Are we any safer than we were before? Will we be more safer because of? No. The issue is beyond Israel and Palestine. The issue today is what I've described. To me, Israel is the canary in the coal mine. If something happens to Israel and they scream, we're next. It's a warning bell. So I think we should wake up to the nature of the threat that we're dealing with and gather information and knowledge so that we know what the intentions are of the people who want to destroy our way of life. And that we are precise in defining who those enemies are and precise in defining who those enemies are not. And, and then I think we have to reallocate resources. There are two places that I think <coughs> potentially threaten the stability, not of the Middle East, but of the world. But certainly the Middle East. The first and the most serious threat that I see is Pakistan. Pakistan is Sunni Muslim. There are 125 million people in Pakistan. They have nuclear weapons. <coughs> they were responsible for nuclear proliferation under the previous administration. And they sold the weaponry and the technology to many of the places around the world that ultimately ended up with nuclear weapons. In my view, if, and, the, and the Taliban is there. And the Taliban, how many of you saw the movie, um, I forget the name of it. No, not Charlie Wilson's War. The, the, the story about, about uh, Afghanistan. Pardon? Kite runner. Kite runner. How many of you saw that? Raise your hand. Okay, you read the book. The book is as powerful as the movie. But as a Jew, I learned that it's almost impossible for people to, to con con conceptualize six million people. How do, you, how, do you, how do you get your arms around six million people butchered and slaughtered for the crime of being born? Then Anne Frank writes a story, a book, before she dies. And in that one story, through the story of one family, one person, the tragedy of the Holocaust becomes much easier to access and understand. To me, the kite runner does the same. For the plight of the people suffering under the persecution of a totalitarian Taliban rule. And the injustice and the, and the helplessness of the victims of their rule. And that one story, to me, tells what it is that the enemy wants to do and why we have to stop them. And the second big place that I think we have to focus our attention on is Iran. Now let me put some numbers up here and put some reality into the discussion. Because people are talking, well, if Israel is threatened existentially, Israel will take out the nuclear reactors in Iran as they did in Iraq and as they did in Syria. That's possible, but highly improbable. Without the active assistance of the United States of America, I'm not sure they can do it. Secondly, let's assume that they could do it. <laughs> let's assume for the sake of this discussion that they have something that I don't know anything about that enables them to penetrate the airspace, complete the bombing with targeted precision. <coughs> there are 72 different sites that we know about. <coughs> Excuse me.
And let's assume they can hit all of them. What does Iran do? What does Iran do? They retaliate. How do they retaliate? Let's assume they don't have a nuclear weapon. Right here, the most valuable piece of geography in the world right now, the Straits of Hormuz. Through the Straits of Hormuz flow roughly 27 percent of the world's oil supply every single day by tanker. Those straits I've been to, I saw them. They're 12 miles wide. There are three islands in here. Greater Tob, Lesser Tob, and another one I forget. Who owns them? Iran. What would it take to close the straits? And what would be the consequences of closing the straits? What would happen to the, the economic consequences in Europe, Japan, and the United States of closing the straits? for a prolonged period of time. You'd have a cataclysmic depression, globally. Now, if that's the case, what does the West do? Let it happen? You're in a scenario for which there is no good outcome. You're in a scenario where if it comes to war, that the likelihood of an economic catastrophe is almost as great as the consequences of a nuclear catastrophe. And it is very irresponsible to simply say, Israel will take care of it. Now, there is a way to take care of it without a nuclear weapon or without a, a bomb strike. The biggest problem that Iran has is the lack of refining capacity for oil. They pump something like four million barrels of oil a day, but they can't refine it. They can't refine it, they can't use it. So they have to export and then import refined gasoline. If we put serious sanctions on them and stop the flow, unless or until they change and modify their nuclear ambitions, I believe we would have an opportunity in a non-violent way to bring about change in behavior. Do I believe that Obama can be successful in negotiating with Ahmadinejad to unilaterally give up the nuclear aspirations of his country in exchange for our goodwill? <coughs> and reintroduction into the world community. I hope he I hope he can. But I don't expect it to happen. So I think that we've got some very serious threats, far, far more serious than the resolution of the Palestinian Israeli conflict. Not to say that that's not worth pursuing. But for you to pursue peace, you need a partner. You can't make peace with Hamas. And Fatah can't control Hamas. So if you end up saying, well, let's have another election in the West Bank, there's a high probability if you have, another ele if you have an election in the West Bank, Hamas will win. Then what do you do? It may be that we're better off sitting for a while, focusing on Pakistan and Iran, and in time, hopefully, if there is some stabilization and lessening of the nuclear threat, there will be an opportunity to come back and negotiate some kind of a broader deal. There is a possibility, not today, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Jordan, and Egypt are all 
as afraid of a nuclear Iran as Israel is. And it is a fundamental existential threat to all four of those countries. And there is a possibility under the appropriate conditions that in time, if we address Pakistan and Iran, that we could put together some kind of a coalition <coughs> with Israel and them, the Arab states, confronting Iran, and in return, once that's addressed, find a way to bring the Arab states into the discussions with Israel and the Palestinians for peace. That's an end game that could play. But it's not in the sequence that we're doing it right now. So my message to you is that we have challenges that are real and we can deal with them, but we need to understand the nature of our threats, we need to understand our capabilities, and we need to be very prudent in the way in which we focus our energies and our resources in achieving the goals that we set for ourselves. With that, thank you very much, and I'll take questions. <coughs> If you want to raise your hands, we'll come around with the mics and uh, give preference to students. Thanks. Um, you just said that a nuclear Iran would affect or um, would threaten Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Jordan, and Kuwait. Could you explain that a little bit more? Yes. Iran is Shia. The four countries that I just mentioned are Sunni. The Sunni and the Shia have been fighting each other since 1,400 years ago. And as I say, the main difference between the two is over who has the legitimate rights to succeed Muhammad at the time of Muhammad's death. And ultimately, today, among the fundamentalists, that translates into who would ruin a caliphate if they created one. And the Shia-Sunni tension has reflected itself over those, four, over those 1,400 years, time and time and time again, in violent conflict with each other. The last thing in the world the king of Saudi Arabia wants is for an Ahmadinejad and an Iran, Syrian Iran, <coughs> I mean, um, Shia Iran, to have a nuclear weapon that it could exert its influence over the region to the detriment of the interests of Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, or Egypt. Even if they never used it, if they had that weapon, it would fundamentally change the geopolitics of the region. Yes? Curious because you you have been um, d in discussion with Bush and um, certainly had. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. High level discussions. Um, what has the reaction been to economic sanctions, and have you made that proposal? And <coughs> also, what would it take? I mean, America most likely wouldn't step out and do it on its own. So, um, can you just comment on how far this might have progressed? Well, there are high-level discussions about sanctions. And there has been a reluctance on the part of the Russians and the Chinese to impose them. And they have had an influence through the United Nations that has af affected uh, the ability of America and others who are sympathetic to stronger sanctions from being able to achieve it. Is it possible to persuade Russia and China that it's in their interest to avoid a nuclear-armed Iran? I think it is. But I think we need to be much more flexible in our dealing with Russia and in our dealings with China than we have been up until now. Yes, sir. <coughs> the voice in the Arab world of fundamentalism seems to be increasing. Uh, to what do you attribute that? First, I believe that we have failed to recognize the threat of fundamentalism. 
and we have failed to define the threat in a way that other people can relate to. And we have failed to try to organize actively to mobilize within the Muslim community itself moderate forces to speak out against the repression coming from fundamentalism to their own people. And I think again that we've I think we've just put too much energy into the wrong stuff. Not to say that we shouldn't fight terrorism. I think we should. But I think fighting terrorists is not the ideological approach to mobilizing popular support for organizing other people to stand up against the threat of fundamentalism. Leaders like Anwar Sadat and King Hussein of Jordan seem to have been eclipsed, and now you have leaders uh, more radical, and you have populations which seem to be radicalized. Now, I don't think it's up for an American president to de-radicalize the population of Iran. What, what is it internally in those societies that's going on? Well, it's a very good question, and uh, it, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, make for a very short answer. Um, I can tell you that I was in Iran from 1961 until 1978 five different times. And over that five year, I mean over that uh, period of time, there were huge positive changes in Iran in terms of human rights, in terms of education, in terms of health care and in terms of uh, uh, economic progress. But it was not up to America's standards. Jimmy Carter, as the President of the United States in 1979, basically said that un he understood that the SAVAK, which was the secret police, which did horrible things to people that they brought into their custody, that the SAVAK was being uh, funded indirectly by American foreign aid. How did he come to that conclusion? There were two stabilizing influences inside of Iran. Iran in 1978, I'll remind you, before this revolution, was the fifth largest military power in the world and we had said it is our strongest ally in the Gulf. And then Khomeini came into power and we welcomed Khomeini as the greatest saint of the 20th century. Okay, now, what, what did Carter object to? Carter objected to the fact that, there, that we weren't operating in Iran at the standard of America's human rights standards. <clears throat> and we were funding the uh, mullahs and the bazaaris, the small business people who ran the little shops in the bazaar. How? We were giving money to the government, and the government was giving tax relief to those two entities. Carter says that has to stop. Till the Savak behaves in a more westernized form, we do not want that money to go. And if the money goes to those two stabilizing forces for the Shah, we will stop resupply of military parts to Iran. And everything they had was American. So what happened is they stopped. Within six months, Khomeini's in power. Now, who in this country is protesting against the brutality of the Iranian government towards dissidents in Iran today. Where is the protest? Where is the, the, the sense of outrage at what they do when you protest and they end up putting you in jail or they kill you? We've made some bad mistakes, my friend. That mistake cost us credibility in the entire Gulf with those countries that are in led by people whose purpose is, interest is to stay in power. I said, how the hell can I trust you? You wouldn't even let the Shah, your best friend in the region, into the United States to get medical treatment until it was almost too late. 
We can't count on you. And as a result, those, sources, those forces that could have been mobilized in support of a more moderate attitude towards both internal governance and external relations were neutralized. And the, and the fundamentalists gained extraordinary power and influence, especially in Iran. <coughs> I think your, your vision of the greatest dangers in the Middle East make a great deal of sense. But I'm curious what you think of the policy of um, invading Iraq, given that <coughs> the greatest threat seems to be Iran. Do you think that the amount of uh, human, the cost of human life and, and money, um, and there's no doubt that Hussein was someone that had to be eliminated, but do you think Iran should have been our target? Well, I'll tell you, that at the time, it depends on who you believe. With the benefit of hindsight, it was a horrible, horrible mistake. At the time, if the French, the British, and the American intelligence services had evidence that they had weapons of mass destruction, and we already had evidence that if they had them, they'd use them, then that was justification enough for us going in preemptively and taking them out. It turns out that information was wrong. Now, why was it wrong? Was it a mistake? Did somebody manipulate? I don't know. But all I know is that the consequence of what we did is not only did we lose many of our, of our sons and daughters, and not only did we spend a fortune in support of that effort, but the biggest beneficiary of our engagement in Iraq has been Iran. And Iran emerges as the strongest military and political force in the Persian Gulf. What you had before the fall of the Shah was the, the Iranians were basically a counterpoint in the region to the Iraqis. And they contained the Iraqis. Now, the Iranians and the Iraqis had a war after the fall of the Shah that lasted eight years. Over a million people were killed. <coughs> a million people. But anyway, <coughs> before the fall, the Shah neutralized Iraq. Israel neutralized Syria and Egypt. And the, at that, in those days, there was a Cold War. There was a struggle for influence between the Soviets and the United States. And the, 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 the great prize was control of the flow of oil or of the reserves of oil. And in that game, up until the fall of the Shah, the Americans were winning. But that was where you played the game. And the game was all about oil. Today. Oil is certainly a factor. I do not believe that we would have invaded Iraq if they grew bananas. But I do believe that the struggle today is bigger than oil. I mean, the 19 people who blew up the World Trade Center were well-educated people from upper middle class families. These were not people of poverty. This was not about money. It's about an ideology. Yes, sir. Are there any, are there any combination of uh, carrots and or sticks that you think might be effective in bringing uh, Putin and uh, China to the table so that they would work with us uh, to try and constrain Iran's nuclear ambitions? The answer is I'm sure there is. At the moment, I'm not in a position to really tell you what they are. But my experience tells me that there always are carrots and sticks. And that if we're smart enough about, one of the things that we do wrong, and I don't care whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, whoever sits in the White House, we've had a tendency over time to try to, to fail to perceive another part of the world through the paradigm of the values and cultures and interests of that part of the world. We've had a tendency to, to apply our values, our culture, our understanding of what's important to them. 
And so we, we don't listen well. But if we listen well, I'm sure that there are things that the Chinese need and want from us, that the Russians need and want from us, that could be inducements for them to be willing to join us in dealing with the thing that we're concerned about in Iran or in Pakistan. Well, certainly the uh, eastward spread of uh, <coughs> NATO might be uh, helpful as far as the Russians are concerned. Pardon? As far as stopping or slowing the eastward spread of NATO on the Russian border might be of interest to them? I, I think there are lots of things. I mean, the, the missile defense system, all of that stuff, we did not manage it well. I mean, even if it was the right thing to do uh, for them and for us, we didn't persuade them that it was in their interest to put that missile defense system uh, into Eastern Europe. And they are afraid of what's happening in terms of the migration east of NATO. And I don't think that, I don't know enough to answer your question specifically, other than to say my life experience assures me that if I did know what I needed to know, there would be something we could find that would meet that criteria. Thank you. Um, I always like attending lectures, but I'm not sure what I should, always, what I should usually do after uh, attending a lecture. Thus, I have two questions for you. Uh, you mentioned ways to deal with Iran, but how do we as American citizens get this to happen? And also, I think the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is just as important as Iran. So what do you recommend we can do to bring a solution to this conflict? Two excellent questions. Let me tell you what I think the first answer is. The first answer is, is educate yourself. I mean, you're all going to get a gift of a book from me, and in the back of the book, there's a bibliography. And in the bibliography, there's a series on Iran, and there's a, a, a chapters on Muslim faith and the oil and the whatever. You pick what you need to know. And there are other books as well, but those are the books I've read that have been helpful to me. But if that's not helpful to you, find another one in that arena. But learn. Sir, I'm really sorry to interrupt, but there are people in the other rooms that would be very nice if you can use your microphone. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Use your microphone. Uh, <laughs> use your microphone. You got people in the other room? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? I'm going to go there. Please go ahead. All right. Um, so the, that's the first thing. The second thing I'll tell you is this. With very few exceptions, and I mean very few, the first thing an elected official does on the first day after he's installed in his office is begin to plan for his reelection. The first thing that happens. Now, you are the people that any elected official needs and wants to help them organize, mobilize, get things done, in, whether it's at the local level, the state level, or the national level. And what I'm doing now, because whenever somebody comes to me politically for money, who's running for federal office, or they come and they want me to help them organize, they want my time, they want my advice, I sit down and I say, look, there are, th there are three questions I have for you if I don't know them. If I know them, it's a different set of questions. If I don't know them, the first question is, tell me why I should trust your character. Because what I have learned in this political arena, and what I've learned in the business arena, <clears throat> the most critical factor influencing effective leadership is character. The ability to know right from wrong, and then you need courage to follow the thing you know to be right and to do it. So I want to know what value, I want to know, it's easy to show me character when you're in good times. I don't want to know that. I want to know in the most difficult time of your life, what values informed the choices you made that would cause me to feel comfortable with you in this position? That's the first question. And if they can't answer that to my satisfaction, the rest of the questions are irrelevant. Then the second question I ask them is, 
what is your view of the nature of the threat to Western civilization of fundamentalist Islam? And how concerned are you about Iran going nuclear and Pakistan going into the hands of the Taliban? And what policies would you support if you were elected with respect to those issues? Now, if I don't get answers that are satisfactory to me, I don't give them a nickel of my time or my money. Now, in terms of Palestine, and what can you do with the Palestinians and the Israeli the peace? Pardon? What would be the third question to the Palestinians? Oh, my, th <laughs> <coughs> my third question has to do, I mean, again, this is mine. Everybody has to form what their priorities are. But mine is education. I don't see how America remains a dominant world power over the next hundred years. And if we don't dramatically improve the quality of the education of all people who are citizens of this country. And I want to know, what are you going to do to make that happen? That's ahead of health care. That's ahead of anything for me. Because that's the future engine that will drive economic growth, that will make health care affordable, that will make everything happen. But if we don't improve that, we can become a third-rate power in no time. Palestinians. <laughs> Let me tell you what I've done that causes me such frustration. I have tried to advance <clears throat> the Palestinian-Israeli peace process. And I've tried to do it through economic improvement in the standard of living of the people living in the West Bank and in Gaza. And anybody who has an interest, I will share with them what it was that we came up with and how we advanced it. But I got this idea, which was a very big idea, not mine. And I got it into the hands of Abbas when he was going in January to a London conference on the peace process in time to influence his choice of what to do. This was a huge idea that could fundamentally change the economic structure of the people in Gaza and create an opportunity for collaboration, cooperation on an economic front between Israelis and Palestinians, absent peace. But as a first step towards developing trust and confidence that could advance peace. And unfortunately, he rejected it. And instead of taking a bold idea that could have transformed his, the life of his people, he took a safe bet and he published a paper of 27 things he wanted to do for the Palestinian people, which meant nothing would get done. So I don't want to say nothing can be done, because that certainly isn't true, something I'm sure can be. I just don't know what it is. And rather than me invest more of my time in something that I feel is of lesser concern to the long-term viability of the free world, I'd rather invest my time dealing with these issues that I've talked to you about. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, can you... Uh, focusing in on Pakistan and Iran, uh, can you talk about the, the tensions that uh, the West has um, in supporting leaders who are not democratic? You've talked about that today, um, that there are not democratic leaders. And, uh, but yet it's interesting that the West uh, supports these leaders who um, also repress uh, the minorities, the ethnic minorities in their own countries. Um, so, you know, it's fascinating how the West supports leaders who are not democratic, who repress ethnic minorities. And uh, you've talked about human rights 
and uh, and that, but yet there, we we t the West tends to be not supporting human rights um, for these other issues like nuclear uh, technology or uh, Al Qaeda, um, and in a way that causes anti-American sentiment <laughs> in these countries in um, in Pakistan and Iran which supports the Islamic fundamentalists. So how do we, how do we move away from this <coughs> paradigm where um, we are supporting democracy in these two countries? Um, we're supporting democracy and the people can, can embrace the democratic values. Well, the first thing I would say is that I don't think that I share your definition of the problem. I believe that what you say is true, but not complete. And I think that what I said in response to our behavior towards Iran was an example of taking the other side to the extreme, of setting standards of perfection. Instead of looking at Iran at the time, in terms of human rights, in the context of what happened 20 years ago, what's happening today, What's happening in Afghanistan? What's happening in Iraq, my neighbors? How does that compare with what the benefits are today for my people? It's in the reality check. <clears throat> there is no perfection in the world. We don't have perfect people. We'll never have perfect systems. We're never going to have perfect choices. So you've got to make choices from less than perfect alternatives. What is it that you're really trying to accomplish? Which is why clarifying objectives is so critical. You better know what's really important, and then you better be willing and able to make trade-offs against lesser things in order to accomplish greater things. Democracies don't grow on trees. Human rights don't grow on trees. This country, as I said before, has been struggling since 1776 to create a more perfect union. And we created a system by which we have an opportunity to self-correct and improve ourselves. But we didn't create it perfect. Blacks had no right in this country. They were slaves. Women had no right to vote. You had to be a landowner in order to vote. Poor people couldn't vote. I mean, we did a lot of things wrong, but we corrected it over time. We got better. We're better today than we were, I believe, 50 years ago or 100 years ago. And I hope we're better 100 years from now than we are today but we'll never be perfect. And we'll never have perfect choices for, with which to partner. So we better be clear about what, what is it that's of interest to us. What are our strategic interests? What are the real risks? And what is the critical few that we have to focus on? And how can we advance that? And it will be less perfect than we would like. But if it, over time, moves us towards a democracy, moves us towards more human rights, moves us towards a better and more f fair system for the people, it's the right way to go, in my opinion. Yes, sir. Do you think that Barack Obama was satisfactory in responding to your questions, your three questions, particularly the first two? I believe that a Barack Obama would satisfy my concerns about character. I believe that uh, as I have, and I don't know Barack Obama, and I've never asked him the question. I've been uh, with people who are very close to him, and I've been with people who've known him for a long time, but I personally only know what I read about him and what other people tell me. But I would, I would basically con conclude that this is a man of principle and character. And he's trying to advance uh, what he perceives to be uh, the betterment of this country and the people within it. On the second question, I don't think he would satisfy me. Um, he is, he has a tendency, I believe, again, I'm, I, I'm at a disadvantage because I've never negotiated with him, I've never really worked with him. But it appears to me that this is a man of incredible self-confidence. A, a great 
great sense of his ability to persuade anybody to his point of view logically and rationally about almost anything that he truly believes in. And that's dangerous. Especially if you're dealing with people where emotion and irrational forces are more influential on your decision making than rational thought. Which I happen to think, and I don't believe Ahmadinejad is crazy, but I do believe Ahmadinejad is committed, totally committed to his vision of what is right for Iran and what is right for his people. And it's an entirely different vision than mine or Obama's. And it's an entirely different vision when he says, I'm prepared to lose 50 million Iranians in order to destroy the state of Israel. Well, I lived through that once. I lived through Mein Kampf. I lived through Hitler telling the world what he was going to do. And I lived through the world saying nobody would be crazy enough to do that. And at the end, he got power and he did precisely what he said he was going to do. And 50 million people died throughout the world in World War II. And 6 million of them were Jews. All of which was predictable, if you believe what the man said. So <clears throat> I think there's a real danger. I think hubris is a risk under any guise, any form. Anybody who really thinks they know and they have a direct pipeline to the truth is in trouble. And I believe that Obama needs a little more humility. And I think it would greatly advance us and him were he to get it. Yes, ma'am, in the back. I was wondering if you could talk for a few minutes about the, the nitty gritty between Israel and Palestine um, right now. The, um, the latest Gaza um, incident um, created a lot of um, emotional response all over the world um, and quite a bit against Israel for um, human rights abuses and um, overpowering an overpowering um, response to the shelling um, from the Palestinians um, and uh, the immediate um, uh, the immediate um, uh, resumption of starting new settlements um, right after that in, um, incident um, and just recently Obama talked to um, Netanyahu about stopping the settlements and he would not answer that um, Six, around that same time, Bill Moyers gave a commentary, which, which I actually saw when he did it, that I believed was very fair. He was just talking about the nature of war. Um, he, the next week, he came back and said he got more mail than he ever had, um, many of them positive, supporting him. There were many pictures of both Israelis and, and um, Gaza residents in horrible condition. I mean, just the travesty of it all, of the war. Um, but many accusations of him being anti-Jewish. Um, it, was, it was very emotional. 60 Minutes did a, um, a piece on, oh, well, there's a part. 60 Minutes did a piece that was, that was well, it's, it's about education, what the, the Israeli um, intention is with the wall. I and guess the, if I would put it so, this way, <coughs> if I would put it this way, for the sake of this discussion, Let's assume that Hanover, New Hampshire is a state, independent, sovereign nation state. Let's assume that uh, London, New Hampshire is a sovereign state. And with each with a military. And let's assume that London starts firing rockets on Hanover. And let's assume they start falling in schools, in hospitals, and your kids are dying, and people in the hospitals are being killed because they can't get proper care. And let's assume that your work is disrupted, and you're afraid to walk because you're afraid that a rocket will come. Now, how long would you tolerate that before you would demand of your government action? 
I want it stopped. And I would want it stopped. And I would demand that my government do whatever the hell it had to do to stop it. Now, war is ugly. There is no such thing as a nice war. And I have never seen anybody who's been in war who says this is a good thing. Let's do it again. It was great fun. War is horrible. War is ugly. There's one thing worse than war. That's giving up your human rights and your right to live in order to avoid it. So it's... It's about how do we go about securing our rights and assuring that we have the right to live and it's respected by those around us as we respect their right to live as well. Israel was not the initiator of this, but they had to do what they had to do to stop it. And uh, the other thing that's happened, it's very interesting, Pakistan right now, the media can't get into north, uh, western Pakistan. We embedded troops with media going into Lebanon. They gotta be nuts. The same thing in Gaza. We just opened up the, there's a limit to freedom access of the press. Showing those horrible, horrible images does not advance the cause of peace. It certainly advances the cause of anti-Israel, anti-Zionist, anti-Semitism, whatever. Because they are not fair. They don't show you what happened before, minute for minute, with, no they don't. Media press coverage does not give you that equal coverage. It does not. And there's a media watch that monitors how many minutes are favorable and unfavorable in reporting on each side. And it's just not there. There is definitely a bias and it's definitely anti-Israel. And at the same time, Israel is going to do and should do, in my judgment, whatever the heck it has to do to protect its citizens. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. I actually had a question about the economic sanctions you mentioned earlier. So the United States and the, I guess, IAEA and a lot of the other countries, oh, sorry, have tried placing economic sanctions on Iran for, I think, over like a decade or even two decades. However, every single time these sanctions have been placed, the cost is more really civilian. Not, it doesn't really affect the government. So these economic sanctions that you're proposing that we begin placing on them now, what new feature will they have that will distinguish them from the economic sanctions that have been placed I think, before? I think that if you, if you did what I'm proposing and you absolutely uh, banned refined oil coming back into the country, that it would hurt the people. It would definitely hurt the people. But it would hurt the government because the people would be uproaring and wanting to have this thing cleaned up. Now, there's no clean remedy. There's no good solution. <coughs> One solution is war. You can make a parking lot out of Iran. That's not an answer. Next to a parking lot out of Iran where you kill 70 million people, what about sanctions that disrupt their lives, <coughs> upset their lives, and in time may cause governments to change or policies to change that can bring about some sanity and some accommodation. So those are the kinds of trade-offs that you have to make. Yes, sir. Two uh, comments and questions. Uh, on your answer on uh, uh, Obama, it seems to me your answer to number two may not be fully accurate. You accused him or, or, or alluded that he may not have humility and being willing to think that he has all the answers. Now, our previous president certainly had that as an issue. Absolutely. But with Obama, and not that necessarily a lot of people probably don't agree, but he's actually going against some of his campaign pledges concerning um, and, and things like the release of the photographs. Uh, uh, he's done a number of things that were not his original positions, and he listened to other people. So I'm not arguing the for or against those changes, but he's proven himself, and he does listen to other experts in the field. He doesn't have a closed mind. Uh, second thing is, Can I sure, of course. That because that's an important yeah. point. In my, vi in my view of the previous president, 
he suffered from hubris of a different kind, but he suffered of hubris. And his hubris was he didn't think he needed to ask. He didn't invite people who weren't in his inner circle in to challenge what it was that he was considering doing before he did it. And that was so costly to America, a failure to do that. Because the errors that we made, I mean, the war was over quickly. The errors were made on the pacification of Iran. And we did so many dumb things that we could have avoided if we had included others who weren't a part of his inner circle but had knowledge about the region and what was likely to happen. Secondly, Obama, in that context, has been much, much more open, has created these counterpoint uh, uh, councils to help him get broader uh, spectrums of information. I'm referring to a different aspect of his behavior. I'm resp responding to his confidence level and his ability to negotiate rationally with people who are motivated and driven by irrational behavior. And that to me is Ahmad Abishad. Okay? That, that's a very specific thing and that's related to his comments, not just two days ago, but in the, in the campaign he expressed those similar views. The other question I had was on, uh, on Iran. There is a reasonable chance that they will get a nuclear weapon at some point. And on the assumption that we're not going to bomb them out of civilization, what are we doing as a country to say, how do we respond to that? We did c have a 30-year Cold War, and we lived through it. And I understand you say that these people are crazy. But there may be some way of containing that if threat should have, it happen. If, I mean, to me, the, the scenario of Iran going nuclear is one horrible scenario after another. I don't see any conflict resolution that is a win. It may be that that has to be what we end up doing because it's the best among alternatives that are not any good. But the, the very least that I can see is an escalation of Iran's influence in the Persian Gulf and an effort on the part of Iran to use Hezbollah, Hamas, and other instruments like it that it will either create or recruit to destabilize Sunni governments that are in control of vast amounts of oil in the region. And I do believe that you will see an escalation of, uh, of arms races in the Gulf. I think that Saudi Arabia, I think that Egypt for certain, Maybe, I'm not sure about Jordan, we'll all try and go nuclear. You get that kind of nuclear proliferation in that tiny little piece of geography. And it's, it's a very, very unpleasant scenario. So I don't have a clear answer. I think the, the, the most important thing for me is stop it. Stop it. Because every scenario, once they get it, is so horrendous that it, it's, not, it's not something that any rational person would want to confront. Okay. Um, you kind of alluded already to education, uh, better educating ourselves, complimenting Obama on, on doing that. Um, and it seems as though in Iran, you're talking about the leader there as functioning irrationally or from an emotional point of view. But isn't it important for us to try to understand, because of course, they're functioning rationally for them. You know, if their objective is to get everyone to submit to their line of thinking about Allah or whatever, um, and, and to maintain power. I mean, just like in Saudi Arabia, as you pointed out, yes, they have a, a, a rule that says nobody can have satellite dishes and yada, yada, yada to maintain power, but they don't enforce it because they understand that that would actually disrupt their power. So all these people are functioning rationally for them. And the more we can understand their rationality, and, and it seems as though engaging them in that so that we can understand their rationality, they can understand ours, and then somehow come to a, 
a medium would be more effective than simply trying to do sanctions or whatnot that haven't necessarily been terribly effective in the past that may simply provoke them. Um, e even assuming that they're not rational seems hazardous. It, it's almost like, you know, our fundamentalist movements in this country, because of course they exist everywhere, these fundamentalist movements. The issue, the issue is, I think, both sides of what you said. Number one, we, it is a mistake to view these people as crazy. They are not crazy. They have goals that are relevant to them. They have strategies that support those goals. They are committed to them. These are serious people doing what they think is the will of Allah as they understand it, and they are determined to accomplish it. So get that point of view I accept. Secondly, while within that construct, I believe what you just said is correct, Hatred is an irrational, emotional feeling. Hatred overrides reason. Hitler had the same construct, I mean, not, not, not in terms of his goal, his objective. He wanted world domination. He had a different strategy for getting it. But the point is that in that construct, his mind was supporting what he felt was necessary to accomplish it. But the thing that drove him over the edge was hatred. And you couldn't negotiate with him because of first his commitment to his goal and then the hatred that overrides his reason to consider logical, rational alternatives. That's what I'm saying we have to be careful of. Not that we shouldn't do what you say, understand clearly, who is this man? What are his objectives? Why is he pursuing these? What is the benefit to his country of doing that? And then understand the irrationality from our point of view. We got irrational behavior as well. What is his irrational behavior? And how will that distort logical conclusions that we think he should arrive at? Thank you all very much. And, uh, and Mr. Zachs will be outside signing books.